Welcome back. I, I think it's time to, to get back to the presentations. Okay, all right. All right, good. Um, just a quick question before we start. How many um, are, uh, are there any newcomers that weren't here for the morning session? Okay, a couple of you guys. All right, all right, thank you. Um, all right, so I'm just um, I'm not going to try and repeat all the all the uh, stuff that I said before. So I'm just going to have a look at some something else. Um, starting with a new technology called uh, VRA uh, VR scans. Um, Soren was kind enough to showcase a little bit of that. Not everything uh, was demonstrated. So I'm just going to talk about. A little bit more about uh, what what this technology is. Um, so let me just adjust this one a little bit. So um, I'm going to start <coughs> by showing you this uh, picture. Thank you very much. Um, and ask how many of you think that the left one is a render, and how many of you think that the right one is a render. Okay. Yeah, that's that's right. Can you tell me how you did it? Uh, how you guessed? The edges. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm going to um, just a brief summary of what what uh, what I'm going to talk about, um, and that's what the VR scans are. Uh, why do people need it and um, how does it fit in, in different pipelines, uh, in a generalized pipeline actually? Um, how did we make it? Uh, how should it be used? And um, what are the, resu the results? For the last two, uh, pricing and availability uh, and, uh, and what we're thinking of, where, where do you think we're going, you can contact Andre, he, um, he's uh, around. So uh, yeah, if you have any further questions, yeah, there, up there. So uh, yeah, if you have any more further questions, you should contact him. Um, now, first, let's start with the idea. Um, how, how was the idea um, uh, conceived for this uh, project? Well, uh, we were working with one pretty large car, car, uh, automotive car manufacturer uh, company which uh, wanted to visualize uh, some of their materials uh, but couldn't with uh, the current uh, set of uh, uh, tools in VRA. So uh, they wanted to, um, they reached, they reached for, uh, for help and uh, we accepted this as a challenge because uh, yeah, some, of the, some of the materials they used couldn't, uh, couldn't be recreated uh, to a full, fullest photorealistic quality. So, we tried to, to, to help them. Um, so several years of uh, prototyping and research passed and we came up with a, with a solution, uh, of course, slowly, but um, um, we developed a, a, a whole process, you can say, of uh, material scanning technology, which consists part of a, a custom built hardware and uh, custom software that uh, working in conjunction creates um, creates a photorealistic material scanning technology. Um, what is the current uh, set, or how how is how is current how are currently things done? Uh, in in CG there is something called uh, BRDF, uh, which is which stands for bidirectional reflectance distribution function, and this function generalizes the way. Uh, surface reflects light from multiple directions and uh, the way it reflects light while seeing from different reflect uh, different angles as well so um, the whole all, all, all this thingy is param uh, parametrized uh, using several parameters such as glossiness and Fresnel values and uh, yeah, IORs but all these are just approximation of how reality works so um, this is not exactly photorealistic it's close to but not entirely 
So uh, if we wa if you want to get something really uh, close to realistic, uh, you should actually uh, well. The only thing to, to, to do is to capture and scan the data uh, uh, meticulously. So um, that's what that's what we did. Uh, we used uh, we used um, uh, yeah, we used we upgraded actually. Uh, there is a certain um, um, approach called PTF, uh, which is bidirectional texture function, which captures also also. Uh, the appropriate colors and, uh, uh, and and some reflectivity, but still we used that and upgraded on that. Uh, uh, we used that as a basis, but in, in, in improved on that and um, based our uh, technology uh, on a much better uh, optical solution. Now, um, yeah, just so yeah, um, I talked about the difference. Um, so. Just a couple of words. Um, it's it provides a really good photorealistic result. It uh, saves a lot of time by taking the guesswork away. Uh, so a lot of artist time is saved by not having to tweak lots of parameters. Just that there are barely a couple of parameters to play around with, uh, because the material is actually as close to reality as possible. So uh, theoretically, if you want to have a physical replica of the material sorry, a, a virtual replica of a physical material, uh, you shouldn't theoretically play around with it because it is already the real thing. Um, and this simultaneously provides a really easy interface to use. Um, it comes uh, where it comes in the pipeline. We, we strongly believe that uh, the automotive, the aerospace, uh, interior design, product design, and fashion industries are just an, some of the industries that are going to to, to utilize this uh, technology, but of course, our users are going maybe are going to come up with with more. Um, the, the the interesting thing uh, about this is that um, since being a, a file format, uh, it's going to it it is actually thought of as inter interchangeable file format between different applications, which makes it even better for scalability and uh, cross-platform uh, sharing and workflows. Uh, how is it made? The hardware, the first part is a machine, a big black box uh, that actually does the, the optical thing, the optical measurement of data. It captures all the data uh, and then it passes that onto a customized so uh, or actually a custom software that we developed at Chaos Group and it assembles the data into a nice and neat uh, file, which can then be provided uh, to the artists themselves. Um, there is another, uh, another side to the software, which is the V-Ray Scan uh, plugin, which has already been shipped with, uh, with 3ds Max and, and Maya, uh, V-Ray for 3ds Max and, and V-Ray for Maya, and it allows you to just pick, it, uh, pick the file up and uh, use it. Um, that's a crude photo of the of the hardware scanner scanning machine. Um, strange angle, I know. Um, and the plugin is available since version 3.1 for 3ds Max and Maya. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, another versions uh, that are currently being developed include Rhino, SketchUp, uh, Revit, Modo, Houdini, and Blender. Now switch to Maya or maybe not exactly before going into Maya I want to come to show you some comparisons and you don't see that okay you should be able to see that now <coughs> so um, before we move on we wanted to just test the technology and and make sure that it gets as close to reality as possible and if if we if we find that uh, we could get close to reality, or you know, say 95% close to reality, and it, or 99% close to reality, whatever you know, there's some high percentage there. Uh, we we will say uh, we will know that the technology is is worth uh, is worth it, and we say, okay, so this is a good starting ground. It's a, it's it's a it's as close as we can get. It's a very good match, and uh, yeah, it works. So. Uh, 
up from, from that starting point, we can say, all right, then we can start adjusting. We, we remove the shaders out of the equation. We can start adjusting exposure, uh, lights, and uh, some GI settings, but we don't have to think about the, uh, the shading anymore. So one of, the, one of these uh, is photo, one of these is render. I really don't know which one it is one, but I just want to, you to take a look at the, at the scanned uh, version and, the, and the, the two versions and think about, um, and think for yourself if it's, if it's getting close or not. A few words about the background. Um, it's uh, actually we constructed the same. Um, we constructed a, a simple studio setup with a with a paper a printed paper. We positioned the lights and the cameras, and then we took the same thing and constructed in in virtual reality or in in virtual scene, uh, and rendered that with the same texture, same positions of light, same intensity, same camera exposure, and uh, yeah, replicated the setup. Here is another version of that. Another one with different material, obviously. Here is yet another one. I'm going to speed things up just to show you that things appear really close. Okay, that's that's my last one. So once we figure out and say, okay, yeah, that's that's pretty close. Reflection, speculars, shadows, detail is is there um, without having to adjust anything. We can go into Maya and have uh, ha and, and let's have a look at, at the thing in action. Um, first thing is I have this simple setup that has uh, some uh, some wrinkles so that we can demonstrate fabrics a bit better. It has some suits that is uh, actually geometry, and I have two materials here. I have lots more actually, but I want to, to draw your attention on just a couple of the shading tree here. I have a switch material, and that switch material allows me to switch between um, these two, can you guys see that? I'm going to zoom in so that you can see it better. So uh, using the switch number, I can switch between the different, uh, the different slots here. So if I, had, if I have zero, I'm going to use this material. Currently I have one and I'm using this material. Now the difference is that the scan, the first material is just the scanned version of the material. So I'm going to render with that a bit later but the, I'm going to show you the shading network of this one. And that's, first we have a bump material. In it, in it, it goes, in, inside of the bump material, there goes a blend material. It has one, two, three layers. And in the base layer, there is, actually, let's have a look at this one here. We have the diffuse color, a bit of reflection using the ward, quite low, uh, quite low amount of glossiness so that we get spread out reflections. Um, then in the other layer here, we have one coating. Come on. We have a cold layer that has uh, that has a bit of um, diffuse coloration and that gets blended using a ramp based on facing, sorry, on surface illuminance and here then we have an angle blended for this for the second layer for the second coating layer which has some coloration some diffuse coloration as well to give it to give me the nice fallback let's have a look at the result okay. actually you know what i'm going to use the progressive render all right And that's the result. I have them already prepared, but I just want to, to show to show that in front of you guys. Okay, so um, this is the result. By the way, the result is also driven by a couple of textures that I already extracted, that we have extracted using the same the same scanner. So now since since we are scanning the material and we are scanning the the old uh, reflectivity dimensionality uh, coloration all these uh, uh, specific parameters of the material we can also extract textures from from this uh, from this uh, material um, such as the diffuse and the and the reflectivity texture which uh, i have used here so there's a diffuse we have a normal map somewhere there 
height map actually here. Um, yeah, and and we can extract those, but even using those guys, you can see the amount of work I had to do before achieving uh, achieving something that resembles the actual uh, the actual material. Um, yeah, that's let's save this one. So it took me a good a good hour, to maybe two, looking and rendering, looking and rendering, even though that I had the textures and I didn't have to re recreate those. So now I'm going to switch to the, the other version. Okay, zero, render, and leave that rendering. Result is almost the same, but I'm going to wait for it to render a little bit more and compare that. And draw your attention to fine details such as this one here. For example, this is a very specific material, you know, it's, it's a kind of velvetish uh, thing that has these small hairs which, uh, which tend to, to break up the reflectivity of the material once you, you, you touch it or, you know, you brush it with, with your hand. It's a very, very, very um, specific thing to this material. Okay, so I'm going to compare that while this is rendering and you can see the difference. Okay, one thing that I can, if I split, side split it, one thing that I, I really want again to, to, to me as an artist uh, to, to draw your attention is that here even, even though I try to do all this mixing there so, so that I can achieve something like this, I start to lose detail there back, back at, the, at, the, um, at the grazing angle and, uh, and I start to lose, uh, since I'm losing the, 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 the detail, it becomes a little bit more flat, it loses depth, uh, while here we have, uh, well, obviously the, the pattern is a little bit different, so I can't exactly tell it, but uh, pinpoint it, but there is, a, there is quite a little bit of uh, difference. Also, another section here is, if we have a look at the reflection, here at the bottom, there is quite a lot of difference in how the, the material re, uh, actually uh, responds to light while it's being reflected in itself. So quite a lot of things that we, we, we have to take into consideration, but my point here mainly is, I can say this is a B, my point here is uh, that in the first case the shading network represents these guys without these two. So this thing and in the second case, I have to pick only one material and I'm good to go, as simple as that. <coughs> Take the material, I have some information about what was the, the, the size of the scanned version and I have a just UV tiling, which actually is a, can be scripted and it's kind of, and it's kind of a, um, it takes the real size of the, fo of the, of the object and matches the tiling of the, of the scanned material to it. Good thing about this is, as, as I showed you, is that we have actual the actual size of the sample. We know the physical dim dimension of this of this material, this swatch. So I can adjust the mapping real easy because in 3D I can tell what's the size of the object that I'm applying it to. Okay, and um, let me show you a couple of more examples now, which um, I have over here. Okay, so that was the setup, by the way. That's the photo setup, and that's the render of the same thing with the scanned materials. So you can see we get pretty, pretty close with different types of materials. Um, I forgot to mention that some of, some of the materials cannot even be created just by using a shader, such as this material here. Um, you know that some, some backpacks have this on the, on the back, uh, it, this material has um, punctured holes inside and the, the, these have actual depth uh, which cannot be uh, captured with any other th with, with, with uh, just textures. However, as you can see, it's a bit cleaner but it captures all the detail and you can get even those kind of effects. Okay, and some other renders from here. try and do the swipe here with a small JavaScript there to show the difference. Okay. Oops, 
sorry. Okay, so still, left one is a is a, a virtually created scan scan material. This one, right one, is a scanned material. Okay. Um, I don't need this one anymore. Um, I have some sets here so that you can get the idea better. So, well, obviously without the water, it's a bit larger. Here are different car paints, nice resolution. As you can see, even the, the bumps, the, the orange peel effect has been captured. Okay, let's get, uh, I have an image based lighting, let's have a look at some fabrics. one, some uh, something else, and these are pretty pretty nice resolution. Here is this same material again, very fluffy. Okay, uh, move on to some leathers. Let's have a look at some interior. Okay, here are different combinations. Um, Another one. Let's take have a look at this one here. I want to show you this one because um, we have constantly uh, we have been asked about the question of resolution. How 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 large detail does it get? Let me increase the, resu the exposure a little bit so that you can see. Okay. So that's a pretty much print resolution, right? And you can see the detail. On the, on the leather, on the plastic here, and maybe if I lower this down so that we can see the, the metal, and so on and so forth. Dimpled skin, yeah. Um, and here is yet another version with some more reddish. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to close this once and um, show you uh, some other compositions that's again quite large resolution we have this one we have this one and that one as well and again the resolution is quite quite large uh, sorry maybe here it's a bit of a uh, okay um, finally I just want to show you Obviously, plastics and wood are um, achievable, but where was my... Okay, I have a small animation there, which, uh, which I have. So that's, um, that's the animated car paint in action. And I have a close-up of that, if you allow me to... So here it is. I have a couple of movies here that show a close-up of that. So it's the same, the same very material with uh, with some depth of field, some flickering, maybe, right. And the same animation from a different angle without depth of field. As you can see, the flakes are static. Uh, there is no. I mean, we have sparkling, but not flickering, which is very important, very indifference. All right. Okay, so um, that being said, um, if you have any further questions, I'll be here and around, and uh, you can, you, you, if you have any questions, just don't hesitate to contact me, or Andre, of course. Um, let's have a look at something else. Um, we have uh, released a new service pack. 
relatively soon, uh, re sorry, rel relatively recently. Uh, so I was about to speak about, in, in my morning session, I intentionally dropped the uh, stochastic flakes. So I'm just going to um, talk about this just really quickly. But uh, since there were some newcomers, I just wanted to mention uh, one of the most important things to me in VOA 3.3. I don't want to repeat all the things, uh, most of you already saw this, but one of the most important things, or maybe the most important things to me in uh, VRE 3.3 was the change of the sampling based on variance, meaning based on visual, uh, uh, visual perceptively visual noise. Um, and I want just to mention uh, the things that, the reason that we needed, or we, the reason that we had to change this, and that was ease of use. With the new image sampler, you don't have to think about um, um, secondary uh, subdivisions, that means no tweaking the lights, no tweaking the materials or the brute force settings, you just have, you, you just ignore these guys. Uh, you have only one control to dictate the quality of V-Ray and that's a color threshold. You get more linear relationship between the noise and the color threshold, meaning that um, if you lower the, uh, and that's by the way with the render times as well, so more linear uh, predictable render times. Um, meaning that if, for example, I increase the threshold twice, I will get visually twice as much as much noise and uh, vi uh, and uh, close to half the render time of the previous render. So I can I can guess how much time is going to take me the next render and how much noise the next render is going to have just by controlling one parameter. Uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, this thing also. Uh, since since the, the, the image sampler is already variance based across the whole image, it generates even pattern, which is much better for the noising, and uh, and gives uh, better control in in in, uh, in compositing, because you have even uh, sampling in the darks, in the brights, everywhere across the whole image. That was not the case in VRA 3.2 and below. Um, Speaking of which, I've, I, I remind myself that I forgot to show you one, one thing and since we're a bit more ahead with 3ds Max, um, I just want to show you the latest, uh, the latest from the uh, Kitchen V-Ray and that's uh, going to be an uh, upcoming uh, service pack uh, really, really soon, uh, which is going to include support for 3ds Max 2017 and uh, a highly expected feature and that's the, the V-Ray Denoiser. Um, are there, um, how many of you know about the, the V-Ray Denoiser? Just a couple of guys, so the rest for the rest of it is going to be interesting. Uh, it's going to be implemented um, as a, and do I have it here, right, as a render element there. And it's uh, going to have, it's going to, sorry, it's going to provide you with the user interface of uh, setting of denoising interactively. So um, it's going to uh, allow you to only generate the render elements needed for denoising or replace the RGB, the beauty pass with the denoised result or create a separate denoised uh, RGB pass in a separate render layer. Additionally, it will allow you to single pass denoise only the beauty pass or denoise each and every element that is needed for compositing such as uh, uh, lighting, GI, reflection separately so that when you combine them together you are going to have a denoised result. And finally you have presets for uh, mild, uh, medium and strong or uh, you can get a custom and you can play around with the settings yourself. Every time you press the update button uh, the, denoising, uh, the denoiser is going to re-denoise your original uh, rendering and, and, and show you the, 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 late res the, the next result. Okay, um, additionally, just uh, one mention here, additionally, since this is just a render element, we don't know if there is, a, V-Ray doesn't know if there is a uh, animation or a still, so uh, you can't denoise animations or uh, at least you can't make them temporarily stable with this, with this setting. So that's why we provide a standalone tool, uh, that one that is going to know that there is, a, that can work with sequences and you can denoise uh, using temporal stability as well and uh, yeah and it, uh, it will work quite well um, I have an example of that so if we get just
just okay. And not this one. I want to load them in PD player so that we can see. Where's my PD player? Okay. So um, let me increase the exposure a bit. Okay. So this is the original one. I'm going to load up the denoised version as well. And the animated one. Um, maybe I need to. Okay, so that's about one. Okay, the second, I need to in increase the exposure of all of these guys. Okay. At the same time. Okay. So, that's the original. Make sure that I increase the exposure just a Well, this is a bit overexposed, but this is because of the projector. I'm sorry about that. I'm going to lower it a bit. So can you see the noise, especially, especially in this area here and uh, a bit here? So if I increase again the exposure, there's quite a lot of noise in there, there as well. So here is the denoised result. And as you can see, there is a little bit of time variance, the temporal variance there, a little bit there. Um, that one above is from the light cache because I rendered it at low, lower quality, but doesn't matter. And now, um, here is the blended version, which has provides much more time stability. As you can see, let me just play it around. Again, gives gives much better result. But more on this uh, with the less with the next service pack. Okay, <coughs> and that's also coming in Maya, of course. Uh, just I just wanted to show the interface since we're a bit uh, faster there. Okay, so uh, going back to to the stochastic flakes material, um, that's um, that's a new material creating flakes, but unlike the old one, oops, I constantly do that. Sorry about this, but unlike the old one. It doesn't represent an actual, actual flakes, it represents the contribution of a lot of flakes, a bunch of flakes, in this current point that we're rendering. Um, my point here is that with the old uh, flakes, if you increase the size of the, of the flakes or, and the scale, you're actually able to see visibly the, the flake. The flake is an individual uh, piece of, of, of thing, uh, is, is individual spot. Um, here, this is not the case. You can increase the scale, and then you're going to see a lower resolution of the shader, uh, of, the res of the shader's uh, uh, flaking uh, effect, but it actually does not represent a single flake. It represents the aggregate effect of all the flakes at this rendering spot. Um, it's a shader that, that's meant to reproduce uh, the effect of sparkling with some stability, with, with stability in in in, uh, in its uh, when it's animated or when you render different angles, um, but it's not represented. It's not meant to represent the individual flakes. And um, I'm saying this because I've I've read a lot of on, on the forums, a lot of uh, our user feedback, um, a lot of our user feedback uh, showed that our user uh, our users are. Uh, misled, misled by the, the, the parameters here, such as flake scale. So I, I want this to be absolutely clear that um, so that you can work easier with the shader. Now the number of flakes controls how many flakes we're going to have. I'm going to apply this material uh, here. Okay, and start the rendering. All right. So now I see only the contribution of the flake. By the way, let's actually remove the sparkle. Okay, so now we see only the flakes. And e even if they tend to look as individual flakes, we actually see the result of a bunch of flakes which can be uh, oriented in such a way that they... Uh, we, we only see the flakes that are oriented in such a way that they see um, that they reflect a ray from the light coming right straight to the camera. Uh, these are, that's the only flakes that we see. The other flakes are oriented and the, the black spots are flakes that, um, well, 
yeah, some of the flakes are not oriented towards the, cam the camera and the light simultaneously, so we don't see their effect. Um, if I want to change this, I can um, I can adjust the um, so to say orientation uh, of the flakes using the blur angle parameter. And um, if I go higher, let I just want to uh, I'm going to go higher like like this. If I go higher, I'm going to get much more even distribution of the flakes as a result. But actually, what happens is more of the flakes are are uh, oriented. Um, in such a way that we see their effect right there in the camera, and not uh, and not uh, they're not that random. Uh, if I lower the number of flakes, I'm going to get very very dark thingy, and just occasionally flake here and there. So let's go back to something about ten thousand. We also have a reflection filter color, which is which is actually the color of the uh, of the reflection from the flakes, uh, obviously. And um, we have different distribution here. I'm not going to talk about these guys. Uh, the important thing uh, I want to mention is the triplanner. You know, sometimes uh, the CAD data um, doesn't have good UV, so you can use triplanner projection if um, uh, if you wish. Um, and I'm going to talk about how this material uh, can be used actually uh, with within a blend material like this. Um, so I'm going to assign the blend material with a bump and plug, plug the car paint inside here, sorry, the, car, the stochastic flakes on top in there. Now things got a little bit slower, so I'm going to render just a small piece of that. Okay, so now we see the flakes even though they have the same color and they have been added on top. And I'm saying added on top because uh, I'm using the additive mode here in the blend material to blend the stochastic flakes with a semi-transparent uh, value. Um, I'm doing this because if you remember the, the, the stochastic flakes itself give, gives black results where the flakes are, are, are not present or not oriented so that we can see them. Um, and these black results are going to darken the image if we use the regular blending mode of the, material, uh, of the blend material. Um, and again, due to the reason that uh, that this shader gives not individual flakes, but the overall aggregate version uh, uh, contribution of the flakes in this point that we're shading, the black value actually there is is actually correct. It's 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 not incorrect. It's it's that there are flakes there that are not turned towards the camera. So we need to use this blending mode in order to get to get the result good. Uh, or proper. Now, one last thing I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to enable the coloration, the, the, the variation in colors, and there you have the option to get random hue, obviously, but what's more important, and it has saturation and lightness. Okay, maybe I can do more saturation. Okay, so that you can see very, very different colors appear here and there. Maybe if I lower the blur angle, I can sharpen the result so that I can see more individual flakes rather than uh, rather than lots of uh, lots of flakes one on top of each other. And what else? Uh, what else uh, we have is the random from map, which uh, actually I have already set up, which gives me the ability to plug in a ramp take the color of this ramp and plug it inside of this slot here, random from a map, and I can uh, specifically say what colors of flakes I would like to get. Now I get a blend between red, green, and blue, uh, but if, for example, I say none and do something like this, I'm going to get only red, green, and blue without any of the nuances behind, uh, between. So you can see you have explicit control over the, the, the flex coloration. Um, yeah. And la one last thing, if I turn on white average, Vera is going to try to normalize, normalize the values here so that the, if you sample these flakes long enough uh, and if you sample them from, a, from, from, from quite far away, the result is going to give a white reflection and not a tinted reflection in, 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 in any of the colors. 
This is good if you want to have a long shot transitions from further away up to close. All right, so um, I believe I covered most of the things related to, to the Stochastic Flakes. Again, if you have any questions, I'll be uh, here all day, or you can contact us anyway, uh, using all the channels that we have. Um, I just want to mention one interesting feature, and uh, that was, uh, that's actually um, uh, the triplanar mode. Um, which actually has been taken from the from the projections of the flake material and the, the stochastic and flake material and has been applied to any texture that you want to uh, use and it's very good for uh, quickly doing you know what I like to say for myself is that I'm lazy unwrapper and I don't want to do to do the unwrapping so if you are, if I want to achieve grungy thing uh, grungy things in here I can do so very easy with the triplanar thing uh, with the triplanar mapping. Now, if I have a look at the UV editor, you'll see that the sphere is not exactly uh, unwrapped properly. It's just a front projection and, and, and that's it. It has lots of seams, uh, maybe some distortion. Um, but, but actually, what I'm looking here is not the effect of this, of this, uh, of this UVs. Uh, what I'm looking here at is the result of the triplanar mapping, which takes um, any texture, and I should have a look at my shader. Okay, it takes the result of uh, uh, it takes actually um, any map and makes three frontal, uh, side, and top projections and blends between the edges. It's a very very uh, simple technique, but now you can use that in V-Ray, and that's there's a triplanar plugin. It allows to, to it allows you to input. Um, several different textures on the three axes. You have uh, scaling, the blend amount, and so on. To illustrate this a little bit better, I'm just going to assign a checker, checkerboard texture for the uh, for this projection. Let's create a new checker. Come on. Okay. And use this one. So can you see where, the, and there we go. <laughs> but you can see nice and clear uh, exactly where the blending is. And by controlling the parameters, you're, you're going to have different, uh, let me just pop up another Maya. Uh, you can see where the, the exactly the parameters, uh, sorry, the, the blending occurs. Uh, this is very useful for grungy style textures, scratches, uh, noises that are 2D, of course, and uh, so on. Okay, I wanted to show something else. Uh, I don't know if I have it somewhere here. <coughs> I wanted to mention um, a couple of things. I have an example somewhere over there. Oops, not here. What was that, 3.3? I don't know. Yeah, maybe I, I can use this one. So, I wanted to show you something interesting. Um, also, since I was, uh, um, I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of people asking me about uh, more information about the Open BDB and the uh, uh, Volume Grid container. Um, so, actually, are there any people uh, working with uh, with uh, volumetrics here? No. Okay. So maybe I, then I'll skip it. <laughs> All right. So um, let me see how I'm uh, I'm out of that time. Okay. Um, Actually, you know what? I'm just if, I'm not going to skip it, but I'm going to run it really quickly through because I think this is very interesting. Um, you can you can load up an open the open VDB example which has been or uh, Field 3D or uh, Phoenix uh, from from somewhere else. For example, I'm going to get the Fire example that has been downloaded from the Open VDB website. But the coolest thing is that as soon as you as you do this, um, uh, the very uh, Volume Grid asks for a preset that you can apply because you know where the data came from. Uh, V-Ray doesn't know, so it can has different me it can have different meanings. Uh, so I will pick up the Houdini Fire Smoke this, in this case because I know it's it's been generated in Houdini and it's uh, and it's fire and smoke. 
uh, as soon as I do that, I will see that there is some information. There is some information about how much is the resolution of the cells of the of the grid and what kind of channels uh, have been simulated. So I know that I have uh, temperature or liquid, but in this case I know it's temperature and smoke. So there are two different fluids at the same time in in, in every voxel. And I'm going to start the rendering here, but before that, I just want to make sure that this is off. Uh, because I'm going to explain it in a couple of seconds. And uh, yeah, let's render with the RT. And I'm going to just um, show you, and I have the track mouse for rendering. Okay, I'm going to play around with the settings and, uh, and while this rendering and just explain those guys. Now, we do have the ability, so I'm going to close the, the input. Uh, by the way, just uh, really quickly, there are some third, third party mappings. If you have uh, more than more than these default channels that are smoke and, and temperature. If you have some other channels, they can be remapped by. Uh, if you have different namings, they can be remapped easy, uh, in here. And uh, all right, so I'm going to close this and make sure that um, I show you the, the the settings for the probabilistic rendering, which was again added in uh, 3.3, which allows for faster rendering. Um, I showed that in earlier in, in an earlier session. That's where it's located in, in Maya. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to have a look at this one and just quickly show that if we have we have the color, we have actually since every fluid can have a couple of shading parameters, uh, the ones that we work with are um, diffuse color, the one that gets reflected from lighting. Self illumination, which uh, we call, which we call incandescence, and opacity. Uh, obviously, that's the transparency or the opacity of the fluid. Now, if uh, you, you can have simple colors, uh, actually, let's really quickly set just uh, this one to disabled so that we see only the smoke. So we can see, you can see that you can have, you can have just a simple color, change its color. You know, play around with the settings, and this is what is being reflected from the light uh, and not emis emitted from the fire. And uh, I know I have a light, directional light that is illuminating my fluid currently. Uh, apart from that, you can take actually the the light from uh, sorry the color from the already existing uh, the channels. So, for example, if I if I take it from the temperature channel, well, obviously nothing happens because I don't have any information in that. Let's try use the smoke one. <coughs> And maybe if I go there, okay, there should be a way to remap that. Okay, let's try a small, small remapping, white, red. Okay, and I need to know the the input values, right? <coughs> So the, uh, currently, this this comes from zero to one, and I don't have any remapping available. Uh, actually, I'm I'm out of this range. I don't see anything in, in, in this because the smoke values are different. In order to see what the smoke values are, I can uh, actually minimize this and use the preview window. Go into the three preview settings, and say, okay, let's have a look at the smoke, and I'm going to say. I don't want the auto range on. I'm going to look only at the smoke. And I'm going to have a look at the values here. So I'm somewhere between uh, 0 0.1, 0. Point something, 0 0.04, and using this one as well. Let's make it more obvious. Red. So the in, in inside parts are with values about 1.2, something like that. 1.1.2. Somewhere there, so I can use this. Uh, I, I can use this knowledge now to to try and reshape this. Actually, maybe I don't have anything else there. All right. So go back to the to the color. So I'm going to say smoke. I'm going to say use the. Oh, that's interesting. That should be fine start okay so and now I do have the alpha but I don't see the smoke in any way so let's try and remap that as well Oops. 
Um, mm -hmm. There is something wrong in here. Let's try the same thing with the incandescence. Uh, where am I? Okay. Sorry about this. I seem to be having some problem there. Okay, so I keep this. I'll keep this as white, or maybe something gray. Okay, and then I'm going to try the, the same thing with the incandescence. Um, all right, so I'm going to say temperature or smoke doesn't matter. All right, and now we now we can see um, some coloration that comes from the temperature channel. Um, same thing can be applied in here um, by knowing what the, the, the values were. So if I go again, if I go back again to the previous and analyze the temperature channel this time instead of the smoke channel, go back. And if I start uh, uh, adjusting these ranges, you're going to see the changes as well. So I don't want natural color. So we have values between 0 0.03 0 and yeah, the auto range actually did it, did it really well and up to about 50, 45, something like this. So if I use the same values here to remap my, my, my um, incandescence channel, I can get a good, a good result. So the offset should be something with the lowest value, what, which is 0 0.003, and the input scale should be something about the highest value, which was about 46, 45, something like that. So I'm going to use those two here. And now I'm, I'm sure that I'm remapping all the values from the input data to, uh, to the, uh, properly, actually. Let's again zoom in so that we can see what's going on uh, right there. And we can see, um, and we can change. So I'm just going to go get down. There is a luminous scale. Everything is way too, too bright. Let's lower this three times, probably. Get to see the result. all right a bit darker but the point here is that now this this ramp here is going to drive the the intensity of uh, the input data from 0 to 1 because I already remapped that and this ramp here is going to drive the coloration so for example if I want to make only the outside part uh, or actually yeah if I want to make only the outside part with different color outside part I'm going to select a small flag in here, set it say, I don't know, blue, and since, uh, and, and nothing is going to happen in the first place because at this end here there is absolutely no intensity in this, in this part of the curve. So let's fix this and increase the intensity at the lowest part, and you can see that at, on the outskirts, on the, on the outside parts of the volume, and maybe some here, but let it, let it update. Something happened. Okay, that's the risk of using the latest builds. I'm really sorry about that. Let's go once more and try and increase. And now the colors even stopped working. Go back. anything in the meantime hmm. anyway it's taking too long let me just uh, reset that really quickly okay and uh, show you one last thing did I render uh, did I reset that okay there we go um, show you one last thing since um, let's actually try and, and change it once more very very quickly so if I try to change this one here to blue maybe I should get something bluish yeah it does get a little bit blue all right and if I say for example I don't want too much intensity at the end but I want a little bit of intensity in the in the middle where there is blue let's try I think this. I think changing this uh, breaks it. So, unfortunately, I'm going to uh, reload it one more time. Okay. Maybe restart the RT. RT, just to make sure it works. Stop it. Run. Okay. 
yeah, all right. Anyway, so uh, obviously this thing, this control here is a bit broken, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to show the latest things and um, I, I'm taking my consequences. Um, anyway, so um, what I wanted to, to show you finally was that if I create, for ex if I create, come on, if, if I create, for example, a uh, simple plane and, oops, and try and scale it up, put it below, okay, you can see that currently I don't have any color bleeding from, from this object uh, on, on the bottom. And I can do so uh, using one of two thing, one of two ways. Um, I can enable the GI, right, and we're going to get the, the illumination from the fluid, uh, which is nice, but relies on GI. So every time, um, so so uh, every time I try to calculate if, if I have, for example, an explosion or something like, uh, which changes the intensity and the lighting drastically. Um, every time I calculate the GI, I'll have to uh, I'll have to recalculate it for every frame, which uh, may be undesired, especially if you want to optimize things and if you want to cache the GI. So one thing that uh, we thought of of, of uh, fixing this is uh, let's disable the GI now and uh, analyze the fluid, analyze the content of the fluid, and apply lighting uh, from its create artificial lights inside of the volume. And, uh, and emit direct light instead of relying on the GI. And uh, this is done by uh, the thing that I did in the beginning. Uh, it's done in the light section, say enable light, lighting. And uh, currently I don't see any, any of those because uh, the power of these lights is not that strong. So I'm going to increase that gradually until I get, until I get something, uh, something that I see in the viewport. So let's try with one, and that's the initial. Actually, that's the initial the, the initial value. Uh, but I had a preset applied, so so maybe that was the reason we didn't see. And you can see that currently we have some illumination coming from the fluid on onto the scenes, uh, onto the scene without relying on on GI. Now here the whole uh, the whole fluid became too too bright, and I can lower the light power on itself so that. I don't get any light uh, light contribution, or maybe let's let's lower it all the way down, so that we don't have light contribution on itself, but we use the actual the, the actual data that we had from the from the volume. And again, I can I see it's a little bit stronger, so maybe we can yeah, do that self shadowing. I can say ray traced self shadowing. Maybe try to. Uh, in, increase this the shadow strength here, but it didn't fix that. But anyway, yeah. So uh, my point here, what I wanted to show you here was actually uh, this the, the effect of illuminating the scene rather than uh, illuminating the, the fluid itself. Um, yeah. So you can utilize this one, and uh, it will work. Uh, it will work uh, uh, great if you would like, for example, to catch the GI and uh, ray trace the illumination uh, itself. Okay, uh, last I wanted to show a couple of things related to, uh, actually are there any, um, are, are there any uh, artists here that are doing uh, some character work? Okay, maybe I can, maybe I can show a bit, uh, a bit about this, uh, some tips and tricks, maybe you didn't know about those, maybe you did, you're going to tell me, um, I think I have some uh, option here, okay, some some guy. And maybe I need to set up the project, but let's see. Some errors, as always. Okay, I have everything in there, right? The assets are there. Cool. So um, that's a model. Uh, that's a model uh, created by Vittorio Go. It's a, it's an artist uh, uh, from Brazil. Um, who was kind enough to share this guy with us? So I wanted to. I wanted to. Um, uh, okay, where was that? I wanted to to show a couple of things related to uh, first to displacement when it comes to character work uh, that can actually optimize your rendering. Um, um, most of you know how displacement works. I'm not going to tackle too much on this one. Uh, I'm going to show you what it. Uh, 
I'm going to just render it first without any displacement so that we can compare. And um, pretty flat. Okay, I'm going to save this as an image. All right, so I'm going to enable the displacement and render. Now the, the details are start, starting to come up. I can maybe introduce, introduce a bit of exposure so that you guys can see that as well. Better. Okay. Something like this. All right. So as soon as I introduced the, uh, the displacement, the render time, of course, went quite, quite up. So from, from 8 seconds to 23 seconds, but we have quite a lot of detail in there. Alright, so um, there are some optimizations that you can apply in order to get faster displacement. Of course, this is not related to character design, of course, but I just wanted to show that because it's more, uh, it's more uh, used in the character uh, design. So there are a couple of options here that I can use, and the first one is uh, by default the geometry in, in V-Ray is, is uh, uh, the, the, the dynamic geometry, or sorry, uh, displacement subdivision here, uh, proxies, these are, these are things called uh, dynamic geometry, and they are created at render time, so that, uh, because uh, by their nature, these guys uh, are uh, high poly, they, are, they, they create lots of geometry, and this occupies a lot of memory, so in order to, to uh, optimize this and not your render to crash, uh, they are treated as dynamic geometry, which is created only for the bucket that is being rendered, not for, not for, the, whole, for the whole thing, and is memory effective. <coughs> However, if you switch to pre-tessellated, this is going to convert all these effects, uh, um, into static geometry, which means that it's going to be generated right before the rendering starts, stored in the, in the computer memory, and then rendered from there. As we all know, the computer memory is the fastest memory that is available to the computer, compared to hard drives and, well, maybe I'm not exactly right, there is some <laughs> CPU memory, but yeah, the, we, we prefer the, ACE, the assets to be there in the memory, so that it's the fastest uh, uh, the fastest memory and provides faster access. So I'm going to do this pre-tessellated and this is going to introduce a bit of a slowdown in the beginning of the render. Uh, this is when V-Ray subdivides the low-poly mesh into, into, into a displaced mesh, stores it in the memory, but right after that every single ray tracing operation is going to be much, much faster, which will result in faster rendering. And there is yet another option that works very well in, in conjunction with that, with that option, and that's called the cache normals, which I'm going to enable. This actually is going to try to cache not only the, 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 mem uh, the, the geometry and store it in the uh, memory, but also cache the normals in which the polygons are facing, so I'm utilizing the full caching uh, here. So let's render. There was a slight slowdown in the beginning, as you saw. That was subdividing the, the mesh. But then again, if I compare, it took 8.8 seconds. Can you see that? 8.8 seconds compared to 8 seconds with the displaced version. So let's compare the original and this one. Great, we have a displaced guy without sacrificing any render time. So if you didn't know about this option, I strongly suggest you try and see it for yourself. Now I have to, I have to say that sometimes this may introduce some artifacts, uh, so you should try it first before relying on that in production, but most of the times it works really well and it saves a great deal of time. How many of you knew about this option? No one? So, so I guess this is very uh, useful for you. Was it useful? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Um, I wanted to show you a couple of uh, things related to hair really quickly. So I'm using uh, Alembic import here. Um, for those of you who didn't know, uh, you, can, uh, you can import Alembic files in the very proxy, in the very mesh, very proxy uh, plugin importer. And uh, there, is a, there is an option, and it also supports particles. There is an option to preview uh, how many hairs and uh, width. 
uh, of the hair can be controlled from here globally. So I'm going to render it very quickly. Okay. Just point out this here. And this is rendered in this way. Now I wanted to uh, I wanted to actually let's render the whole thing first and just uh, render small regions after that. <coughs> now since the project was done in 3ds Max, <coughs> um, I exported the hair from uh, from uh, our or Natrix, which was the plugin of choice of the artist, and I exported this as a lambic and imported that in Maya. Uh, now I'm going to talk about how different materials can be applied to this uh, to this hair object. Currently, this uh, this object has uh, a default material. Let's have a look at that. Sorry, it has a regular V-ray material which has a 50% gray, uh, a 50% gray uh, V-ray color. Okay, so the result is something like this. Um, it has thickness, it has a GI inside of it, uh, there is a, uh, everything is as it should be, but um, I'm going to talk about the very hair material, which, uh, which I have in here, which is actually optimized for rendering hair, uh, optimized for rendering multiple uh, strands of hair. Now if I if I apply the regular V-ray material on this hair with the same coloration, with, with some color, actually, uh, sorry, uh, I messed it up, anyway. <laughs> and I should apply it on every object in my scene. Okay, so here is the hair. Uh, go back, apply. I want to show you the difference, uh, the difference that it makes uh, between using a regular material, because you can do so. You can use a regular V-ray material to, to, to shade the hair, but first it's going to be slower, and second, um, it's not meant to, to uh, since the hair has its uh, own physical properties such as translucency, uh, the, the, the hairs usually are very thin, they tend to, to, to transmit light through them, um, uh, this effect can be achieved with the v regular very material, but it's, uh, it's not going to look the same because it's not meant for this kind of uh, thin, long geometry. So, uh, this is the result that we get, applying some... I'm going to stop it now. Oops. Okay, I'm going to stop it now, save it. Alright, and render just now some regions so that we can compare. Now watch what happens if I apply the very hair material and as you can see I'm using absolutely the same color here in the diffuse slot and in the diffuse slot in here. I'm using primary specular as a reflection and a similar reflection color so that I can get the two, the two renderings uh, uh, relatively similar. If I use the same color there uh, the result wasn't exactly the same. But as you can see, first the rendering took quite, quite less. And also the effect of the, the, the reflection and the, the um, anisotropy effect is much nicer. We can also see, we can also see the trans transmission here that I already applied. And in order to compare that, I'm going to render yet, actually let's, let's use the same rendering region. To um, uh, sorry, there is no transmission at all. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, let's let's, however, see the effect of getting the transmission and getting the actually the subsurface color in there. Obviously, this is way too much, and this is because I have put intentionally a light at the back so that we can see the transmission going into effect. Now, one one of the two things that I can do is lower the intensity of the back uh, light or just lower the intensity of the transmission from here. But you can see what drastic difference we can see, um, uh, we see in, 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 the, uh, in the shader when using some transmission. Transmission It fills up these empty volumes where the GI cannot, uh, cannot go that, that uh, deep further and it also changes the overall appearance, appearance making it much nicer and, and, and uh, 
realistic. So let's uh, make a quick comparison again. Just save this one. So that was with the regular VRE material, absolutely no translucency. That's the hair material, no translucency, much cleaner result, faster to render. All the translucency, uh, tr yeah, the transmission all the way up, a bit less of a transmission. You still get the nice uh, fall off here at the back from the blue light that I placed and you get a nicer and faster rendering. Um, final, finally, maybe a lot of you guys know that, but I just want to mention that, and um, you can assign, sorry, here, there you are, you can assign a transparency texture to make the edges, uh, the, the end of the hair um, transparent and uh, make them nice and fizzy. For example, if I, if I have a look in, there, in, in here, uh, the hair gets to thin out, uh, the natural behavior of the hair is to get thinner and thinner. Uh, currently, the, the, the width of the hair is quite quite thin, so we can't see maybe, maybe the result. Um, but but um, it, if, you mod if you do this within your hair plugin, actually taper the hair at the end, um, this is very hard to NTLIS because the ray tracing rays sometimes miss, sometimes don't, uh, very rarely hit the object and it gets hard to NTLS. So a good way to, to, to do this is to keep the width uh, consistent and apply a transparency map only at the edges so, uh, so that it gets this uh, disappearing feeling. So, um, however, yeah, the way you do this is using a hair sampler shader, and I don't know if you can see that, it's a hair sampler. I'm going to put it in here. And uh, in addition, I'm going to create a ramp so that I can remap the information coming from this hair sampler. The hair sampler is actually going to give me uh, several informations, uh, s several types of information from the, um, sorry, from the uh, hair generating plugin, and you can see the types of uh, information uh, that is available. It can give me the distance along strand using a black and white. So uh, the darker it is, the closer to the the root, the whiter it is, the closer to the tip. Um, it gives you the output color that has been produced from the uh, from the uh, hair generating plugin. For example, if you use shave and haircut, you can set up the color there. You can pick the color set up from the hair and uh, shave and haircut plugin with this color, or uh, actually, sorry, the out color is the is the overall color, and you can pick it up with the hair color in here. That's very useful because, for example, uh, again, shaved haircut has uh, this cool mutation uh, mutation uh, system there with some colors, uh, some hairs can be a bit whiter, a bit uh, different color, have different coloration. You can pick this color uh, and assign it there uh, from here. Okay, so I'm going to use, um, if you want to have a more variation, you can use also the random by strand, which is going to give you random black and white value depending on on for the every different strand. So I'm going to use the distance along strand, hook this up, come on, hook this up as a V coordinate and plug this in the transparency. And now I'm going to use black and white. So we render. And now as you can see I don't know if you saw that, but the difference was very, very subtle. I'm going to save that up. Actually, we can do it on the on this edge here. So we already have this rendering. Let's re-render. Okay, compare. I don't know what's going on there. Saving some render elements, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So let's compare that can see quite a lot more transparent 